Fora TV. The world is thinking. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in this country about the fact that society is increasingly litigious. And it's now become quite a popular phrase to talk about compensation culture. People will be familiar with the stories such as the banning of um, playing conkers in schoolyards, um, boring, risk-free playgrounds, because people are frightened of being sued. And last year, uh, a former pupil of a grammar school was awarded £100,000 damages for neck injuries um, while playing uh, school rugby. And John Dunford, who runs the Headmasters Association, said, Heads have become increasingly reluctant to sanction such activities without a very careful risk assessment, and that often results in the activity not taking place. So I think we can say that there are serious implications of litigation and litigation avoidance, regardless of what, one, um, what side one takes on this. There's discussions around personal responsibility we need to have. There's discussions around whether it leads to defensive practices in, for example, medicine and education. And then, of course, there's the whole issue of litigation avoidance, which I hope we'll discuss, uh, which is trying to avoid being sued. Taking a, a step back, though, in a recent Mori poll, 78% said that they supported using litigation and that, in fact, they thought it was morally and socially acceptable that they would sue. And even though you can kind of ra you know, run out with all these kind of stories of uh, litigation madness and compensation culture, maybe that's to trivialise an important issue. Maybe increasing litigiousness actually represents empowerment. Maybe this represents a new assertive citizenry uh, defiant, active, informed, fighting back. And maybe we should ask, shouldn't those in power, corporations, doctors, councils, employers, be held financially accountable when things go wrong or when they don't deliver services? In other words, there's a lot to discuss here, and we have a, a, an excellent panel to kind of mull these uh, debates around, not necessarily polarise for and against, but to actually kind of dig deeply into this question. Now, having said dig deeply... And even though I'm a great opponent of dumbing down, they're only allowed to speak for five to seven minutes maximum, which obviously doesn't really allow them to cover everything they've ever thought on this issue, as they're all very well qualified to talk for a lot longer. But hopefully they'll give us a sort of sense of the debate. We can then uh, discuss that on the panel and with you and really try and work out what's going on. Let me introduce my panel. First of all, I'm delighted to have um, Philip K. Howard here, who's a well-known leader of legal reform in the United States, He's here, um, especially from America. Um, America, as we know, is the home of uh, litigation. And uh, in some ways, that allows us all to indulge in a, a, a certain amount of uh, the favorite pastime of anti-Americanism. Um, but anyway, uh, that said, uh, Philip is one of the opponents of that trend, I think we could say. He's the author of books such as The, Cl the Collapse of Common Good, How America's Lawsuit Culture Undermines Our Freedom, and The Death of Common Sense, How Law is Suffocating America. And he writes on op-ed pages in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post. He's a corporate advisor and strategist. And he's also the chair of an organization in America called Common Good, which is a bipartisan coalition which aims to restore common sense to American law. We then have uh, John uh, Paisner, who's a professor of law at Lincoln University. He is uh, a solicitor. He's edited The Litigator. He founded a course in advanced litigation. He had 17 years, he's had 17 years experience in litigation practice. Uh, he's worked in law centres, uh, um, latterly specialised in uh, medical negligence. He was a member of the Lord Chancellor's Committee um, uh, on Claims Assessors, the Blackwell Committee, and is a member of the Civil Justice Council. So he's uh, coming at things from a slightly different uh, perspective. Uh, then next to me we have uh, John Holbrook, who's a barrister. He practices public law at 2 to 3 Gray's Inn Square, London. And he writes on the law for The Independent, The Times, Spiked Online, who are the online sponsors um, of this festival. And he actually wrote a really interesting, if you haven't read it, Battle in Print, specially uh, commissioned for this session. Um, if you haven't read it yet, do look at it because it's very um, thought-provoking. And then finally, we end up with uh, Sir Bernard Crick, who is not a lawyer, which is something of a relief. Um, he specialises in politics. I mean, he's a very well-known figure, and many of you will know him. I suppose if you want, he's our wise man on the panel. But why it's very important to have somebody who 
is involved in politics is because this is not a debate about law in a technical sense. In some ways, the whole debate about litigation is also a debate about contemporary political trends. And so that's why it's great to have uh, Sir Bernard here. He's Emeritus Professor of Politics at Birkbeck College London. He's a former advisor on citizenship um, to the DFES, and then an advisor on citizenship and naturalization and integration for the Home Office. He'll be speaking later, in fact, on those kind of themes in who are we in the 21st century. And he's, of course, the author of In Defense of Politics and George Orwell a Life. So I'd now like to start the debate and ask Philip to kick us off. Can we just give a big welcome to Philip Howard? Thanks. Um, it's, uh, should I hold this? No, you're all right. I'm all right? Okay. Yeah. How nice it is to be in London. Um, uh, America has become uh, the way we New Yorkers think of California as the sort of exporter of bad ideas. Um, uh, when it comes to legal systems, we have, uh, uh, have exported uh, what you call the compensation culture over here. We were having a conference the other day. Uh, we did some projects jointly with the Harvard School of Public Health and some doctors from Sweden were over there and they said, we didn't used to practice defensive medicine, but then a few graduate students came back from the United States and before you knew it, our entire <laughs> medical culture was changing. So, um, so I'm here to take full responsibility for everything wrong <laughs> with your legal system. You can, you can try to sue me. Um, the, um, uh, I think trying to cut, give the five to seven minute version of this, I think that what's happened in America is we've lost sight of what the role of law is in a free society. Law is the foundation of freedom because it sets boundaries of, of civilized behavior. Uh, you have to abide by your contracts. You can't steal other people's property. Government is constrained and can't misuse its power in a variety of ways. Uh, in a functioning legal system, if people should feel comfortable doing what's reasonable and acting in sort of within a broad scope of normal behavior, and they should feel nervous doing what's wrong or unreasonable. At least in America today, everyone feels nervous doing almost anything out in society. Um, and that's because we've adopted a kind of open season approach to litigation. Why we did it is uh, not a secret. We woke up to lots of abuses uh, by people in authority in the 1960s, racism, sexism, others. We changed our law in many good ways. And one of the ways we changed it was to uh, say that we could avoid bad values if we let anyone make a claim for almost anything in a neutral process. We gave that a name hallowed in our legal culture, individual rights, but in fact it bears no resemblance to the rights against state authority that um, our founders had, had, had given us. These were affirmative rights basically against other, against other private citizens. And the effect of that was not so much that, I mean, there, there has been an increase in litigation. It's more or less uh, gone up about 250% since the 1970s, but it's sort of leveled off. And, uh, and it's not so much that most cases in our, in our country, civil cases are decided by juries. Um, it's not so much that juries are generally bad. Um, a recent study by the Harvard School of Public Health said that basically they were wrong 25% of the time in medical malpractice. So three out of four on the one hand isn't so bad. On the other hand, if you're a doctor, having one bullet uh, in four chambers is not such an attractive way to go to work um, every, every day. But the effect of it, the effect of the sort of broadened consciousness that a lawsuit is available if you have a disagreement in the workplace or such, has literally changed the culture. So in healthcare, um, again, another recent study, over 90% of doctors say that they regularly order tests and procedures that aren't needed. Very hard to measure the cost of that. Certainly over $100 billion in America, which is enough to provide health care insurance to the 45 million people who don't have it. In America today, 29% of all births are done by cesarean section. In Ireland, it's 4% with the same outcomes. Uh, teachers have lost control of the classroom, not because of lawsuits for damages, but because of a kind of a expansion of the idea of due process. We have to fill out forms for any disciplinary procedure and people can drag you into hearings uh, and, and such. Um, we did a survey uh, a couple of years ago, 
found that 78% of American teachers, middle and high school teachers, had been threatened by their students with lawsuits. Sort of a change in the, change in the culture. Um, uh, businesses don't give references anymore. There was this episode, incident a few years ago where a crazy nurse killed 42 people in a series of hospitals in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. After it came out, uh, it turned out he was a terrible nurse, a strange person. They would see him in the, in the hospital rooms with the wrong medicine and people who weren't his patients, and he would be fired. He'd go down to the hospital down the road, who, which would then call up the prior hospital and say, can you give him a reference? The standard practice in America today is to say, we confirm that he worked here from X to Y, and nothing else. And he literally went through a series of hospitals and killed 42 people before he finally discovered that, that these mysterious deaths were in fact murders. And after it was all over, uh, what the doctor said was, gee, it was too bad. We would have given him a terrible reference, but we were scared he might sue us. Uh, recreation has been transformed in America. Playgrounds have nothing athletic in them. The, the stuff for children to play on looked like inflated, multicolored versions of things you would see in a gerbil cage. Um, you know, maybe for three or four year olds, but not for any, no climbing ropes, no, no jungle gyms, uh, nothing of any excitement. And we did a, a forum uh, earlier this summer in Washington where sort of educational psychologists appeared from around the country. And basically, we're, we're, we're studying the cognitive development of children by not allowing them to take the risk required to grow up, learn how to deal with each other, learn how to deal with, with, uh, with ordinary physical risk of life. You know, how far can you go and climbing and not, et cetera. Um, probably the stupidest thing in America, and I don't know if this, if this is true in the UK or not, are all the warning labels. Caution, contents are hot. You know, on every coffee cup in America. Archaeologists will dig us up in a thousand years and they'll think of some kind of aphrodisiac and try to, try to uh, uh, you know, extremely hot. Uh, try, to, try to find the formula to recapture lost glory. Um, there's a contest every year called the Wacky Warning Contest where they give out as a prize one of my uh, books, The Death of Common Sense. And uh, one of the winners last year was a five-inch fishing lure with a three-pronged hook on the back that said on the side, harmful if swallowed. <laughs> now, these stories are all, none of the people in any of these stories are doing what they think is right. Not the doctors, not the teachers, not the people doing playgrounds, not the manufacturers facing these. What you know, what's wrong is they don't trust the system of law. They don't trust it because it's missing something. It's missing law. And uh, law is not supposed to be a neutral process. It's not, lawsuits are not just a dispute resolution mechanism. They're a man manifestation of the, of the powers of the state. And if you let people sue for anything, just to drag you through the process itself, uh, will deter people from acting normally and having normal relations and acting on their best judgment. And uh, fundamentally, what we lost sight of in the 1960s is that suing is not an act of freedom, it's a use of state power. Coming down to that contingent verdict where the marshal will come and take your home away, or whatever, depending on the amount of the verdict. You can't give that to someone else without the protections of law, without everyone being fearful. And so what's happened in America, it's like a version, this odd version <coughs> of anarchy, where we cede st state power to any angry, person, you know, any fanatic, and then wonder why everybody in the society is acting uh, as if there's a hair trigger. Everyone's got something, you know, sort of all around them. It's a version of cavemen where we hide in our caves all day long now, not saying what we think to other co-employees, not taking kids out on field trips, never putting an arm around a crying child. That's a complete no-no in America today because who can defend you if they say it's an unwanted touching? Literally, that's the rule in America. You can't put an arm around a brown child. Um, so we act like cave people. Parents, and then every once in a while, when, when you have the good luck of something really bad happening to you, you can pounce you know, and sue for hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's not a civil, or million. It's not a civilized society. It's not the way law is supposed to work. And there are a whole group of us now, including 
senior judges and presidents of universities who are spending a lot of our time trying to get a movement to basically not to stop lawsuits, because we do need lawsuits when people act wrongfully, but to reestablish boundaries that are knowable so that people can distinguish between right and wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, very useful start and a slightly different perspective, perhaps. John. Thank you very much. It's, uh, that's fine. No, it'll pick you up. Okay. That's fine. It's uh, delightful to be here and to meet my fellow speakers, none of whom I've ever met before, but uh, John Holbrook's just told me that uh, in the 80s when I had a little firm in Sheffield, he was a client of mine, um, <laughs> that apparently went off okay because he's not proposing to sue me for giving him <laughs> negligence advice. Okay, so what we're talking about here is something that's described in the introduction as our litigious culture. And what I want to do is take one part of this and actually argue whether this is a fact or a myth. And I've given you some graphs on your seat, which you should have. Um, if you look at the first graph, which has a purple line uh, on it. I know, we haven't got, we're not in colour. We're not in colour. All right, the, the top one, okay. <laughs> For those of you watching in black and white, the, the red ball is in the top corner. Okay, so the top one, it, this is relates to some research that I'm doing at the moment, and this is a year-by-year -year, uh, search into all newspapers published in the UK of references to the compensation culture. Okay, if you go back to 93, there were three cases, okay, one of which was a, an article in the Daily Mail by Alan Massey, the novelist, which deals with all of the stuff that we now read about in the Daily Mail ten times a day. Every single trope was referred to that all the issues that we're concerned about now were referred to in 94, but nothing happened. It wasn't taken up. But you'll see that from 1998, 1999, it suddenly starts to spike up. And it reaches its crescendo in 2003-04. References in newspapers to the compensation culture, almost always in pejorative terms. Now, why was this happening? It happened for two reasons. From 1947 to 2000, we had a legal aid scheme in this country which underpinned our litigation. It was effectively a bank. Lawyers earned a reasonable living but not an excessive living, and litigation was not controversial. Insurance companies paid out. Everything went around fairly normally. Predominantly in the area of personal injury, which was the central focus in this country, as indeed it is in the States. In 2000, uh, that system was abolished for personal injury cases, for all money claims cases, and replaced by a bizarre Byzantine system called the No Win No Fee Scheme or the Conditional Fee Scheme, which I could keep you here all afternoon explaining how it works, but for the purposes of this exercise, it doubled or trebled overnight the costs of insurance companies. Now, these were insurance companies that insure your houses, your cars. They hadn't reserved against this cost. The stock market was going down. Their income was going down. Very competitive market at that stage with the internet taking off. They couldn't increase their premiums. So they were pretty upset about this, and they started to respond. And you'll see that from then on, the reference to the compensation culture went up and up and up. Now, it tipped down in 2004 because of the insolvency of something called the Accident Group, which those of you who ever spend any time watching uh, daytime television, I mean, obviously, you're not all academics, so you don't have a chance to do that. Um, <laughs> but you'll remember this was uh, a claims management company uh, which advertised under the slogan, where there's blame, there's a claim. In fact, what there was was one dodgy paving stone in Manchester where there were hundreds and hundreds of accidents over the same paving stone. They had a huge business which went up into hundreds of thousands of cases over a two-year period and then collapsed. And you may remember all the staff were then dismissed by text message. Um, and I have a slide usually which shows the mobile phone with we are afraid you have been dismissed. At the bottom of the phone, it says options, as they usually do. You press that, it says you have no option, you are sacked. <laughs> From then on, the claims management companies disappeared, um, and we've begun to have less references. Now, 
to the next graph very quickly. This shows the number of cases. In the same period, the number of actually litigated cases, cases in court, declined steadily. Now, I understand that not all cases are litigated. Many are settled, but I can tell you that insurers do not settle cases uh, unless they believe that they are likely to have to pay ultimately something. There's a real controversy, and particularly if it's a serious case, they will fight the case. So there's two very odd things going on. My view is quite simple, and we can return to it as we go along. The insurance companies decided, as a body, to react to the huge hike in what they were going to have to pay by starting to talk to their friends in the media, starting to talk about what they identify as a litigation culture. They used the, uh, the trope that we often do in England, bad things come from America. Um, they said, we're all going to hell in a handcart along the lines of litigation. We're going to become litigation hungry like the Americans. Of course, the centre of litigation in Europe is Germany. They have much more cases in Germany in the courts than they do in England or per capita in America. But you never hear about that. They began to influence the media. Journalists, with all due respect to any here, are relatively <coughs> lazy. They began to get onto that bandwagon. And the more you heard about compensation culture, the more you heard about compensation culture. We then all reacted in the way that Philip has outlined, becoming, by becoming risk averse, by losing common sense. So we actually have to address this issue by beginning to go back and actually understand what is the real place of litigation, how much litigation should there be, what is the right reward for lawyers to take the risk of doing these cases, and how to avoid over-litigating. Thank you very much, John. A very useful rejoinder, I think. Okay, um, uh, John Holbrook. I should say that as a result of the advice that John's firm gave me over 20 years ago, I was able to recover about £500 of overpaid rent from a landlord, which, which leads me to conclude that some laws are very good laws. Um, but I should also add that I think in a, in, a, as a, in a client capacity, that's the only time I've ever been to a firm of solicitors. I don't want anyone to think that I personally have been adding to the compensation culture. Um, let me first of all explain what I think this debate is about. It, it, it's not actually about the number of claims that are issued. Um, if by litigiousness we mean a number of claims that are actually issued in court, then I don't think that's a, a, a good way of understanding the problem. It's not a good way for understanding the problem because once the courts have decided what the principles are, then it is inevitable that defendants who can see the writing on the wall will settle, and they invariably settle these days before cases are issued. Um, indeed, the rules were all changed in about 1999 precisely to make it that much easier for parties to settle cases without the need um, to issue claims. So whilst there are those who try and deal with this debate by producing tables that show the numbers of claims issued, and uh, some even put those tables into graphical form, um, it, it seems to me that that really does rather miss the point. The, the problem for me uh, is really one of legal regulation. There are now huge swathes of life which are affected by a legal framework that hitherto were not affected by that framework. And let me just give um, four ways in which that has happened. Um, first of all, and perhaps most obviously, there are many more new laws, um, new laws that affect areas of life that were previously unaffected by any form of legal regulation. Um, I'm thinking here of statutes like the Data Protection Act, the Freedom of Information Act, antisocial behaviour legislation and discrimination law. All of those laws are fairly recent um, and they affect um, areas of life um, in ways that were not previously regulated by the law. Um, I was interested to note that Lord Phillips of Sudbury, who is a Liberal Democrat, Democrat um, peer, tried to resign from the House of Lords recently and he cited as one of the reasons for doing so the fact that there was so much re um, legislation coming out of government. It, he had counted it up as 13,000 pages of new laws every year and if you take into account that about 4,000 pages are repealed every year that means about 9,000 pages of new legislation every year. Most of that is secondary legislation but it's no, no less relevant um, for that fact. Um, the second reason why there's more legal regulation is that um, laws have become much more expansive in their scope. Just to take the example of health and safety legislation, that used to be fairly narrow in its focus. So, for example, it would have said 
that where dangerous machinery was in use, it needed to be fenced. Nowadays, health and safety legislation is not necessarily that specific. It may talk just in terms of risk and require employers to carry out risk assessments in respect of any machinery that is being used. Um, and it's in that sense that um, it is much easier for people to bring claims on the basis that that risk assessment wasn't car carried out properly. So it's not just a question of counting the number of pages that have been put forward by Parliament, it's a question of seeing what the effect of those laws is. Um, the third reason, it seems to me, is that existing laws, which have been here for many years, many of which are very good laws, have actually been developed in such a way that they now bear very little relationship to the way in which they were originally conceived. Um, I, I have in mind here particularly the law of negligence, which when the House of Lords decided the case of Donoghue and Stevenson in 1932, which every law student knows about, that was the case where somebody sued because she found a snail in a bottle of ginger beer. Um, when that law was originally conceived, it was intended to, to, to be of reasonably limited effect. Um, the notions of duty, <coughs> breach and damages were always expected to have a rather limited um, effect, not least because the notion of fault was intended to be meaningful, intended to suggest some sort of moral culpability for which the offender must pay. That was how Lord Atkin put it in 1932. Nowadays, the notion of fault does not tend to mean that. It tends to mean nowadays that with the benefit of hindsight, it is possible to say that the defendant could have done something different to have avoided an accident. And that is why the law of negligence has expanded um, to embrace just about any claim that somebody now wants to bring. Um, and finally, th what's happened is that the courts have been very good themselves at creating new areas of jurisdiction for themselves. I think you can trace a lot of this back to the 1993 case of, um, of Tony Bland, who you may remember was um, in a persistent vegetative state and had been in that state for three or four years after the Hillsborough disaster. Um, and the irony about this case is that all the medical people, all the family agreed that the life support system needed to be turned off, and yet they still proceeded into the High Court to seek the court's authority to turn off that life support system. Um, at the end of the day, sort of six months later, nine judges all concluded that that was the right thing to do, which rather begs the question, why did anyone go into the High Court in the first place? But it, it does show, it seems to me, the willingness of the courts to expand their jurisdiction to regulate these sorts of issues. And indeed, there are, since that case, there have been a whole number of cases that have been taken to the High Court, whereas in the past it would just have been medical people and families that would have taken the obvious and sensible decisions, whereas nowadays they feel the need to seek the court's approval. Is this a problem? A lot of people, as Claire said in her introduction, see this as uh, an expression of a civilised society, the fact that um, people are um, accepting legal regulation and bringing claims is sometimes seen as, a, uh, as, as an expression of an assertive citizenry simply seeking justice. Um, I don't think that's right at all, and I give two principal reasons for that. First of all, it seems to me that the law is a very blunt instrument. Um, the law is an ass, and the reason why it is an ass is because it cannot deal with the complexities of life in the same way that people can deal with them. It is necessarily something that is put in black and white. Um, now, I know these days modern legislation tries to overcome this problem by being so sophisticated so sophisticated, actually, that m many modern-day laws are impossible to understand. But, but the, the point is that no matter how sophisticated the legislation comes, it can never be as sophisticated or understanding of all the relevant circumstances as individuals can be themselves. Um, uh, I think it would be fair to say that good laws are those laws which, are, which deal with simple and obvious problems, um, which are specific in their application, and which use notions like reasonable, um, such as the law of negligence when it was conceived in 1932. But of course, you, you can only make use a notion like reasonable um, in an effective way if you are actually reasonable in when you are interpreting and implying those laws. And, and these days, the notion of reasonableness is often quite a one-sided um, notion, which doesn't actually embrace all the, the values which one ought to embrace when one is considering whether or not an action is reasonable. Um, but the second reason why it seems to me that um, all this legal regulation is so dangerous, and this is the important reason, is that it does fundamentally 
take issue and it takes power away from individuals. Um, that, I think, was obvious with the bland example I, I gave a few moments ago. Um, but it actually affects so many different areas of life, from, from the very mundane, um, which I frequently see in county courts when I see lawyers arguing about whether little Johnny will see his mum or his dad at the weekend. Um, th those arguments take place because there is a legal framework that regulates access and those sorts of dispute, and it takes power away from individuals to resolve these problems themselves which I'm sure they would be able to do if the courts weren't so willing to get involved. So it goes right from that very mundane level um, up to a very important political level. Um, I was looking the other day at the Equality Act that was passed um, a few months ago and will come into force next year. That will set up the Centre for Equality and Human Rights, which will have a statutory duty to promote equality and diversity. Now, we can all argue about what we mean by equality whether we think diversity is a good thing. That's great that we should do it. But what I want to know is why should those arguments take place in the courts on the basis of interpreting a statute, which is exactly what will happen over the forthcoming years when people argue what those terms mean um, in the Equality Act. Um, so finally, and this comes back to the point I originally started, there are some good laws. Um, laws are good if they enhance human freedom. Um, but nowadays, there are far too many laws which restrict human freedom. And they do that because they deny people their essence, namely their ability to act rationally. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. <coughs> yes, as long as people act rationally, which, which they don't always... Um, so that's a temporising remark, as you'd expect from the author of In Defence of Politics, arguing the whole politics is about compromise. I think I'm um, somewhere in between um, Philip Howard and John Holbrook and um, John Pesner. Um, yes, I'm very glad of that graph, because very often perceptions and reality are not um, hand in glove with each other. It's like the scares about paedophilia. There's absolutely no, I was going to say historic evidence, but then history sounds a long way away, but, for, but over reasonably accurate criminal statistics for the last 50 years, there's absolutely no evidence that paedophilia is on the increase. Indeed, if there's any evidence, it will be interpreted on the contrary. Similarly, crimes of violence. And yet the press has already been pointed out, um, will headline, oh, you know, just a murder. Well, you know, yes, 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 yes. But will headline a murder or will headline a case of paedophilia as if it is absolutely common. And it puts everybody in a panic. It puts everybody in a panic and everybody fearing risk. I'll come back to risk in a moment. Or oh, no, I think I'll start with risk. Because I think there is a very big cultural change. Oh dear, Claire, here I'm agreeing with you. In which, um, you know, a, cul rare, a cultural... Well, wait, I'll see. Um, in which there is a cultural change in which people, as has already been said very eloquently, are becoming risk-averse. I don't think it's anywhere near in this country what it has reached in the States. But let's be on our guard because there is a tendency for many of these habits to spread across the Atlantic, and some are spreading already. For instance, the advertising of law firms. That firm that was referred to wouldn't have gone bust. Well, I mean, it wouldn't have existed if they hadn't been allowed to advertise in a way in which the professional discretion of the older generation of lawyers wouldn't have allowed at all. Now, let me get to risk, and I'll just be anecdotal. I have prostatic cancer. Well, I've had it for 15 years, so that's quite good news. Um, but I asked my doctor um, um, when it seemed that radiation treatment was the thing, what was the risk of it going wrong? He knows me fairly well, so he looked at me and he said, do you understand the concept of probability? I said, well, I said, I will bluff you. I'm really a political philosopher, but I've mixed with social scientists so much that, yes, I do understand the concept <laughs> of probability. So he said about 5%. So I said, why did you ask me? He said, well, if I said 5%, do 
to somebody who didn't understand the concept of probability, they would immediately think, I was looking at it on the bright side and what in fact I was saying that they were bloody well likely to die, that it was about 90%. Um, people do not understand the concept of statistical prob um, probability. Now, of course, this is grossly self-indulgent, but still it may be cheering to some men over 60 present. Um, <laughs> prostatic cancer can have certain um, urological effects. And so I asked the urological surgeon when I had to see him um, what was the risk of the thing going wrong, the operation. And we had a s somewhat similar, though I had to push him rather hard actually to get an answer. And he said, oh, about... 60% um, success rate, 20% no change, 20% it'll make it, make it slightly worse. So I said, well, I'd put money on that horse. Um, but again, I explained why I asked the question, and he said he was very adverse to giving any kind of prognostication because people would always think he was being over-optimistic. Now, I think this is a very general thing, again, to come back to the press, very much fed by... Well, yes, all right, the ignorance and laziness of journalists, but also the growing sensationalism of the press, and not just the tabloid press, but the way the Guardian, the Independent, and the Times also feel their readers like to know what is going on. So from early editions of the Sun, the Mail, or the Record in Scotland, they will at least give a fairly good summary of some latest, some late exceptional case. This is very difficult because I think it spreads very widely into the political culture. Why are we one of the most over-centralized and interfering states in Europe? Governments now making a tiny gesture towards more powers for local government. It's a very small one indeed. Well, I've got a very simple theory that both parties, both major parties, when they were in opposition love to get hold of a case of some damn silly action by a local government. The Darlington Labour Council owns a race course and because they found they also owned a horse, they followed it to Paris to see how it ran. And this ran in the Daily Mail for about three weeks and a good many of our fellow countrymen must be under the delusion that Labour councillors did very little but follow racehorses to Paris. And the counter-attack in the mirror was all too easy. They actually paid for somebody from London to go down to Malden on the train. That's not very far. Um, and um, pretty good substantive evidences of estate agents getting on the council in order to do favour to themselves. And again, a general climate created that the exceptional is the real. And I think this all goes back to this lack of, un, lack of reportage on the news, even the Today programme, or particularly the Today, Today programme, seems to be completely uninterested in reporting public opinion polls. They subscribe to Mori, they subscribe to the other two major polls, but they very rarely tell us what the public actually thinks. What they do is to bring on a, I'll be very provocative and nasty, they bring on a weeping widow to say that her son died after taking the triple jab. And not even John Humphreys will point out that after can be a causal concept or it can simply be a grammatical c -c connector. He also died after crossing the street and after putting on his trousers. But this has a tremendous emotional effect. So I think I'm arguing in all this controversy for just a little bit more of statistical sense, but I wholly agree that the rights argument has really got out of hand. And sitting next to Claire, I slightly defend what we actually try and do in the citizenship culture, because never, never do we say rights without saying rights and conjunctive responsibilities or rights and duties. And after all, that was the ancient Roman and the ancient Republican way of doing things. 
to have the rights of a citizen gave you the duty of acting like a citizen and being responsible. And if you were mutually interresponsible, you don't need you don't need to go to law so often. I don't quite take the view, talking of republicanism, of Tom Paine, who is alleged to have said, I've never actually found it, that liberty will come when the last priest is strangled in the guts of the last king over the body of the last lawyer. But <laughs> it seems to me we are actually debasing law by not narrowing the sphere of law to those things in which there clearly must be laws rather than the random responses of politicians of both parties to the day's headlines. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, I've, I've got a few questions before I go out to you. There's obviously loads there. Um, Philip, just starting with you, um, there's been a, a very shocking case uh, in this country of um, a, a, a drugs trial that went wrong, which has uh, 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 led to one of the people who suffered being called the elephant man, his head blue, yeah, and so on and so yeah. forth. And one of the fascinating things in the paper has been, you know, that's been very widely followed. And then you, re you realise that First of all, they've now been told that they're not going to get their medical uh, examinations carried on, and actually they probably aren't going to get, receive very much compensation. And I am a great critic of compensation culture thought, that's not fair. I mean, my mm. God, surely at some point, if anyone deserves a bit of money, they do, mm. uh, and a bit of medical cover. So there is obviously an argument which is that what is wrong with being able, if you're a, a, a small, an ordinary person, a citizen, you're up against big corporate interests, maybe represented by the likes of you, um, you know, surely all that litigiousness does is give you a bit more of a, a, a level playing field. Well, lawsuits have two goals. The first goal, which has been lost, is to, is to reflect the values of the society, of right and wrong to encourage people to abide by their contract, drive cars reasonably, all that sort of stuff. And it's very important, just going to that example, which I'm not aware of, that people who are conducting drug trials should not do so irresponsibly, and they should be liable if they do. So I'm, I'm not gonna disagree with that, and that's, that's the goal. Uh, we've come to look at lawsuits simply as a dispute resolution mechanism. The magnifying glass comes down on the victim in our country, could something have been done differently? In every single accident that ever occurred in the history of mankind, something could have been done differently. You know, you could have had someone, uh, an attendant at the playground, watching the four-year-old on the seesaw. You could, have, you could have done all sorts of things. You don't have to have a law degree to come up with.